Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Audubon Alliance for Coastal Waterbirds. Uh, it was launched in 2012 through a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Long Island Sound Futures Fund. And it's a partnership between the Connecticut Audubon Society, Audubon, Connecticut, and the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute of Natural History. And we work together to conserve water birds and their habitats across the, the coast of Connecticut. The Alliance recruit, uh, recruits and trains new and returning volunteers each year. We're up to about 500 volunteers that help us out with shorebird conservation throughout the state. We coordinate those volunteer monitoring efforts uh, throughout the season and keep the volunteers uh, engaged through weekly mail, email updates and blog posts. You can find out about us, you can Google um, uh, uh, Audubon Alliance for Coastal Waterbirds, You'll, it'll take, it to, take you to our blog or to our Facebook site. Um, working together, the Alliance staff and volunteers explode nests, protecting the plovers from predators. We put up string fencing around waterbird nesting sites to reduce disturbance in nesting areas and stop outright trampling of the eggs. These birds lay their uh, eggs directly on the ground. We also work to engage beachgoers and municipality by providing information about beach nesting bird species, the threats they face, and how to help. And overall, we want to promote a share the shore mentality. We don't want to see these beaches closed down to visitation. We want people to be able to enjoy these beaches. And they think with good management, uh, there's plenty of room to share the shore between people and birds. Um, uh, together, the Alliance is engaging community and protecting coastal habitats throughout Long Island Sound, helping humans and wildlife to coexist for the benefit of both. This year, thanks to another generous grant from the Long Island Sound Futures Fund, we have expanded our work to help reduce uh, disturbance to migrating shorebirds in addition to our work on our nesting coastal waterbirds. Things like red knots and semi-pollinated sandpipers, birds that have declined by 70 or more percent just in the last few decades. And migratory stopover spots, spots are very important as you're gonna learn from Brad's talk. It's been a very challenging season for us but we've seen a substantial drop in the disturbance of the migrating shorebirds, just to some simple tweaks that we've been doing. And our nesting birds have been far more successful than they would have been without our efforts. There's probably nobody in New England better at talking about shorebird conservation than our guest here tonight, Brad Wynn from the Manomet Center for, for Bird Conservation up in, in, in Massachusetts. Um, I've seen Brad give several presentations on shorebird conservation and they're always absolutely stunning visually, and uh, I always learn something new every time I see one of his presentations. Brad is Manomet's Director of Shorebird Habitat Management. He's been at, he's been at Manomet since 2011, uh, working towards Western shore, uh, Hemisphere shorebird population recovery, including teaching shorebird ecology and management workshops. He's coordinated the International Shorebird Survey. A lot of you have seen, seen uh, have been volunteers for the ISS and contributing to the development of Atlantic Flyway Shorebird Business Strategy, which we're helping to implement here in Connecticut. He's also uh, been busy performing field studies, including Arctic Shorebird Demographic, uh, uh, the Arctic Shorebird Demographics Network. Uh, he's also been working on trying to get red knot population estimates, which is very important because our Rufa red knots are incredibly uh, threatened and also uh, um, working on Wimbrel migration ecology. And you're gonna hear more about Wimberl migration in, in this evening's talk, and they're just absolutely amazing and fascinating birds. So without any further ado, uh, welcome Brad Wynn. Hey, thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> it's really great to be here. Thank all of you for joining tonight. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not in front of you and with a live audience, but um, hopefully again before too long. Um, tonight's talk, um, as Patrick has mentioned, um, I, I want to end this end the talk in in Connecticut on the coast of Connecticut, uh, but I want to take you on a little bit of a journey. Many of us can't uh, can't travel right now, so I was hoping to um, bring you along on on a shorebird migration, if you will. Um, many shorebirds do similar things um, as far as migration and the mi migration patterns I'll be talking about uh, can be um, attributed to uh, many of the species that come through Connecticut. Uh, and it, and it, we're going to be following a, a one wimbrel in particular uh, through its migration. 
I also want to talk to you a little bit about just shorebird biology and migration biology of how these birds make these enormous flights and uh, give you a, an image of uh, what migration must be like for an individual shorebird. Um, and uh, as I indicated, take you through the full life cycle of these birds. So um, if there are any, um, any issues with the, the slides, I guess it's, uh, it's gonna be driver error and I'll take responsibility. But uh, thank you all at Connecticut Audubon for uh, pulling this together and uh, all of you for joining. So let's see, I think they have control over the slides here. I think they do. There we go, okay. So a little bit about management and where I'm based and some of the work that we do. Um, we have something we call the Shorebird Recovery Program at management and it's, it's divided into three uh, units, work units uh, of science, site-based conservation, and habitat management. And as Patrick mentioned, I oversee the habitat management um, arm of Manomet. Manomet has been around uh, similarly for a long time as Connecticut Audubon. We started in the late 60s and uh, Brian Harrington joined in early 70s to really start the shorebird work. And uh, back then it was preliminary Preliminarily, the, um, the um, really basic um, biology of shorebirds was still somewhat unknown at that time. Um, and so Brian's work was instrumental in, in what we're doing now and how we are, um, how we are uh, doing our work and, and where we are, are focusing our work. Uh, so we have a science wing that, that does uh, research and that Arctic Demographics uh, Network uh, that Patrick mentioned is one of our larger projects and involves um, has involved as many as 30 different partners across the Arctic doing similar research um, uh, at various sites. The beauty of uh, working with shorebirds in the Arctic is that they show great site fidelity to, uh, most of them show great site fidelity to nesting areas and so we're able to return uh, to a site year after year and see some of the same birds on the same, on the same territories. So it's a, a rare, um, rare moment that we can work with um, of shorebirds uh, consistently uh, because of their tremendous geographies. Uh, our site-based conservation initiative is also um, the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, uh, WISERN, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, and it now has, WISERN um, has about 107 uh, sites designated uh, for shorebirds in, um, throughout North and South America, throughout the Americas. Um, our habitat management division uh, works uh, with both of the other divisions uh, to deliver uh, management techniques uh, and um, initiatives to some of those sites uh, within the Western Network uh, using the science from our science uh, group. So uh, the photograph you're seeing here is uh, the north slope of, um, of uh, the Brooks Range in Alaska. Uh, we've, we've worked in eastern and western uh, Arctic and subarctic regions doing shorebird uh, research. So what is a shorebird? Um, we, we break water birds in general up into four categories and seabirds are the, the terns, skimmers, gulls, um, and, um, and pelicans. Uh, we classify those, Mostly, most of those are fish eaters, uh, waterfowl are another group, uh, all the ducks, geese, and swans. And then we have uh, wading birds down the lower, um, the lower uh, right. And then the lower left are the shorebird group. So shorebirds we'll be talking about today and um, sandpipers and uh, the um, uh, oyster catchers and uh, stilts and all of the plovers as well uh, would be in the shorebird group.
We have uh, a broad look here with the various flyways of the world, and there are shorebirds migrating in all of those various flyways. If you look over to the, uh, if you look way over to the right, um, you'll see our Atlantic uh, America's flyway, and that includes everything on the east coast of the, of the U.S. all the way down into South America. Um, it's a general um, and quite accurate in most cases. Uh, the, the shorebirds do, uh, in our part of the world, do migrate down there. There are certainly exceptions. We have birds coming from as far away as Alaska uh, that come to our shores along the Atlantic coast. Um, and then there's, there's some that are east-west migrants. Um, marbled godwit, for instance, um, going up into the, the, plant, the, uh, the grasslands and prairies of the the western uh, states and in, in southern Canada are more of an east-west migrant than north-south. Um, but tremendous um, uh, interaction here throughout the world, which, which uh, I'll get to in just a minute as far as uh, one of the, one of the uh, things about shorebirds to me, one of the more intriguing things is that they, they really connect peoples and cultures and languages and they cross borders uh, seamlessly and uh, can be real uh, diplomats for us uh, talking to other, uh, other countries and peoples. So um, the theme for tonight's talk is gonna be this um, circular migration. And right now, as Patrick mentioned, if you start with the breeding areas um, to the north of us, uh, the uh, boreal forests on up into high Arctic regions. Uh, the birds are definitely shifting south, and some of them have been for quite a while. So we're right there where that arrow is pointing down to fall migration, and uh, it really hits its stride in, uh, in July and uh, peters out in this part of the world pretty much toward the end of September, but a lot of those birds continue uh, south. So the the monthly time range you're seeing here for the various parts of uh, shorebirds' uh, life are, are kind of on the, the wide margins. So uh, wintering November um, uh, through uh, February really is um, more of the, the hub of, uh, of wintering. Some uh, like piping plovers, short, short migrants that get onto their wintering grounds in a matter of a couple of weeks. Uh, in the Bahamas or even in the southeastern U.S. can be down there as far into, um, uh, they'll be down there in as early as September, so, and stay right through April, for instance. Uh, and then if we, we think about the wintering time for these birds, so we're, we're kind of borrowing them from the south. So some of these birds spend most of their time in, in tropical or subtropical areas, and some of them even farther down into uh, South American temperate uh, regions, uh, the non-breeding period uh, for them is actually uh, the springtime and summertime in South America. So they're taking advantage of these seasons and most of the advantages uh, has to do with food availability. So these birds are doing what they're doing primarily uh, in their quest to uh, maintain um, their body weights. Um, they go through molts. Um, once and twice a year, and they need a great energy load for that. So migration and energy and breeding are really kind of their biggest uh, energy needs throughout the, throughout the, throughout the year. Um, the, the northbound migration tends to be, for an individual bird, tends to be, um, uh, well, for all of them, uh, a fairly short window. Um, May, in this part of the world, the birds come through uh, pretty much in May. June is kind of that um, uh, the low uh, for long distance migrants uh, and you're on the east coast of the U.S. anywhere. Um, June is a is a blank month because there are usually very few birds around but as Patrick indicated uh, at the end of June things definitely start to switch and, um, and turn back to uh, uh, turn back to migration. So this is, gets a little wonky uh, to talk about, but I think it's uh, fun to think about. Um, and uh, if you look over here, we have females. Uh, so think about the birds uh, right now, this time of year, 
Um, July into early August, the, the females have uh, generally left. Those are birds that are um, that have uh, successfully nested and uh, have the, the females leave before uh, their mates or their young uh, leave the Arctic. And, uh, and, and then males, some of the males that uh, fail nesting also head south during that time. So um, July to August and then to mid-August and then, um, and then the, and that relates to this little uh, modal hump in the in the migration with the numbers of birds that are coming south and in this case we're talking about semi-palmated sandpipers um, and semi-palmated sandpipers um, are a good classic shorebird uh, one of the more abundant uh, shorebirds in North America um, the east eastern uh, Arctic breeding group has definitely been declining uh, and we do have hints of why that's happening um, so back to our chart, sorry. Um, uh, adults are, proceed, are proceeding uh, juvenile, so into August. This is uh, uh, the largest uh, push right now for shorebirds during migration. Um, it's right here, and we're right in the middle of it. Um, and then, as Patrick mentioned, we're right on the cusp of, uh, of some of the juvenile birds coming south. Uh, so all the adults that say have left, or majority of the adults have left, and then the juveniles start to come south, and those are um, uh, hatchier birds that start uh, coming down after the adults leave. So um, that's the smaller um, dark lines here with the young birds coming south. Um, so over here, an adult uh, semi-palmate sandpiper, and then on this side, many of you recognize this juvenile bird that uh, nicely uh, scallopy wings here, uh, no molt at all, feather perfect. Heading, heading south. So with that in mind, um, I want to talk about energy a little bit. We're talking about food and um, and, and shorebirds do some amazing uh, weight gains. And I wanted to, this is uh, a colleague of ours, Tina Spearsma, who put this little chart together about body weight, but but any of us can go out, any of you can go out and, um, and look at shorebirds on the coast and get an idea just by looking at that profile of the, their migra migratory condition. So um, shorebirds that are staging in an area will come in, fly in, and be quite skinny and thin and light. And uh, over a period of weeks, uh, sometimes a, a month or, or six weeks, um, some of the shorebirds take that long to put on enough weight, but they, they will end up uh, putting on a, a good layer of fat and also building up a lot of their uh, body muscles. Um, so. For us, uh, in, in uh, tidal conditions along coasts, um, their energy comes mostly during the low tide periods um, when the tide is going out and then coming back in again when you have the, all that exposed mud. All their food resources um, generally are, are in that intertidal zone. Um, the, the high tide time is time for rest, so the birds are, are quiet and, um, and need that rest to digest all the food that they're uh, consuming during uh, during the low tide period. Uh, so uh, for us, um, these birds, if you think about uh, their migration, uh, is taking place uh, kind of the height of our summer. So for them, the real bottleneck and, and the one that uh, most uh, states and uh, NGOs such as Connecticut Audubon work on is protecting those birds during that high tide period when the birds have uh, a limited number of, of, of uh, of square yards or, or acres to rest on, and uh, they need that uh, time to be a, a quiet time and not, uh, not disturbed constantly. So uh, a surprising thing that people um, might not be aware of is that just prior to migration, um, shorebirds actually, uh, their, their digestive tracts actually atrophy and much of the proteins within the digestive tract uh, and all the organs that, that are used for digestion atrophy in a very short and are reabsorbed in many cases in a very short period of time. So birds that are feeding vigorously will suddenly, um, uh, just before migration, just stop feeding altogether. They'll be preening for a couple of days. They're, uh, they're exercising. Um, on the way north, they start uh, vocalizing quite a bit. There's a lot of 
uh, kind of pre um, pre breeding site uh, vocalizations that begin to build, and you can hear that on the New England coast in the spring, just before the birds go. So in May. So what does that look like? That weight in reality, if you look in the upper uh, the upper right here, uh, this is a, a wimbrel that's just come in after migration and has expended its fat, has burned its fat as fuel on migration. These are long, uh, hot migrants, so the birds uh, go long distance and absorb uh, or use that uh, muscle as they, uh, sorry, lose the fat. Um, uh, they burn the fat on the way and use those big muscles uh, that they've uh, gained at that staging area before migration to, uh, to uh, motivate them to get to where they're going. Um, this is a bird. This is a bird actually in uh, Cape Cod and Wallfleet, uh, one of our study birds. This, is, um, this bird is uh, literally a day. We know it's a day before it migrated. Uh, there's a, we actually have a, a satellite transmitter on this bird. And this is an antenna going out of the back of the uh, bird that uh, left uh, Cape Cod just after this. But it's a, if you look at the, the body weight or the body width, this is the kind of thing you, any birder can see in the field. And it's uh, looking at the difference between, um, you know, this very flat keel uh, here with a very th thin line going down here compared with this bird that actually has, you can see a layer of fat. This is belly fat, uh, and this is a very large breast muscle that's built up uh, for soup, some super flying. So huge transition here. And for wimbrels, the food resource, wherever they are, is small crabs, um, at least in the temperate zone. They eat a lot of berries and insects up north. But when they're with us, they're eating uh, fiddler crabs. And salt marshes are a key part of their migration. And, um, and so the, the um, if you're if you're looking for wimbrels, I would recommend getting in a kayak on a, one of your quiet marshes and just paddling around. I, I imagine that they're out there um, uh, in your, especially this time of year when the young start to come down. I think Connecticut should get some uh, young birds coming to the marshes there. Um, so, why shorebirds? What what's up with shorebirds? So. Those that get into studying shorebirds get fairly addicted, and there's some um, there's some good reasons why. Those that are um, that are bird fanciers, that are um, birders, uh, get intrigued with uh, the brevity of some of the visits. Uh, Baird sandpiper coming through, um, leopard will, or a white rump sandpiper. Um, there's a reason for those extended wings, those long, super narrow wings are built for long distance flying. And those birds will go from here all the way down into the southernmost southern cone of South America. Fairly amazing since they're really just a little bit larger than some of our smaller peeps like least or, or uh, western sandpipers or, or semi-palmate sandpipers. Amazing flights they take. So uh, they really amaze us with their migrations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they connect us. Uh, they connect countries and peoples, uh, multiple languages. Uh, we're, we're fortunate enough at Manhattan to have um, our, uh, many of our, our WISERN, Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network staff of the Executive Office of WISERN uh, in South America. So we have a great chance to interact with um, uh, both um, Spanish-speaking uh, countries and peoples and uh, Portuguese in, in Brazil, um, and we used to be able to travel and we would teach workshops in these sites. So uh, hopefully again soon when this uh, pandemic eases up. Anyway, they connect a lot of us. If you imagine a white rum sandpiper up in the uh, northern uh, Hudson Bay region that um, kids from uh, villages up there will see that it could be the exact same bird that's seen you know, uh, a month later uh, down in Southern South America somewhere. So they really are, um, they are ambassadors. Uh, they are vulnerable to extinction. Many of our shorebird species are, um, have quite low numbers. Some of them uh, have not um, bounced back from the, uh, from the market hunting days of 1800s and early 1900s actually, uh, when we uh, had no laws, no regulations to, uh, protect uh, shorebirds and other wildlife, actually. Uh, so 
Uh, many of the populations uh, remain low. Um, and then something that really drives me every day is that uh, shorebirds really do respond to conservation action. So when uh, we put energy and effort into um, uh, in the resources into uh, protecting sites or training people or um, uh, changing human behaviors a little bit, we can uh, make great inroads into, um, into uh, uh, rebounding populations. So uh, a, a driver for me is, uh, is the fact that they do respond well. I want to touch briefly on some of the major threats right now uh, that we've um, brought out through our Atlantic Flyway Shorebird Initiative work um, with many partners. So hunting, believe it or not, in some parts of South America uh, and the Caribbean still is, uh, we think, uh, high enough. There's enough pressure uh, in that part of the world that it could be limiting or even driving some of the declines we've see we're seeing in, in some of the populations. I, we have predators on here because in some areas, uh, predation of beach nesting birds particularly uh, is enhanced by in, in uh, human influenced areas with populations of raccoons and other ground predators. Uh, crows have turned into a big issue, uh, as many of you know, work with piping plovers. Um, so predators there uh, in, um, uh, in conjunction with other pressures uh, have been targeted for, by us. Uh, as one of the major threats. Uh, human disturbance, uh, very widespread um, uh, throughout uh, coasts of the world uh, is definitely contributing to, um, in some cases, uh, lack of uh, survival in some of the birds. Uh, habitat loss and change is a big one, of course, and uh, with uh, the changes going on with uh, climate change and sea level rise, uh, we definitely uh, need to keep that in mind. So um, I'm going to go a little bit faster here. Um, so to be effective in conservation, we have um, really uh, three, um, three hurdles immediately with shorebirds. They're super migratory, as I've mentioned before, covering giant geographies. So how do you, how do you work to protect birds like this? Um, and many of them, uh, both good and bad, uh, form high densities in particular stop oversights. So this can be good because we can work with the people on the ground where these birds are in high numbers, but uh, it's challenging too because um, a, a local threats can really uh, damage populations. So a challenge there. And then coastal wetlands, as we, as we all know, and interior wetlands at all, uh, as well, are, are uh, highly threatened. Um, I want to start, this is a story of, of Wimbrels. I want to go through migration with you starting in the tropics. Uh, the scene you're looking at is uh, from uh, north coast of South America. It could be in many different countries, but Wimbrels on a, on a mud sand flat backed by mangroves, mangrove forest, um, seems to be um, um, very important not only to Wimbrels but a lot of other birds as well. Ruddy turnstones, um, semi-palmated sandpipers, throughout Suriname, Guyana, Brazil, uh, these coastal mangrove forests intermixed with uh, sand and mud flats um, are really uh, key to a lot of birds that um, migrate down there to the coast. So we'll start you down there uh, on the coast and, and um, we're going to talk about uh, one actual bird that we named a Hanu and we tagged this bird on Cape Cod. Um, and uh, that was back in 18, 2018. But we'll start here in Brazil down in the corner. And I'm, I'm not sure if you can see all these stripes on my screen. I'm not sure where those came from, but I apologize for those. If you can see them, if, if it's just me, then that's, um, that's great. I hope it's just me. But uh, anyway, the bird's down here and, and uh, its first flight is a nonstop flight, generally from uh, this, let's say, uh, San Marco Bay right here. And, north coast of, um, of Brazil. <laughs> this would be a non-stop flight across the north coast of South America. It would cross, cr you know, cross the entire Caribbean basin. Um, and this is an actual or, or very close to actual flight line for the bird. So right over the Keys and cuts across the entire Gulf of Mexico and ends up uh, here in Texas. So that's a 4,000 plus mile uh, flight 
and uh, at about 40 miles an hour or so, um, depending on wind direction and, and other uh, or storms. If there's any storms along the way, it could take four or five days for that bird to, to fly over here. And that's night and day flying. Um, and so that when the birds are leaving, they uh, would look more like that very heavy wimbrel um, that I showed you earlier, and then uh, and then arrive um, uh, in a much lighter condition here in Texas. Um, we've put together, uh, based on connections we have and tracking people down, we put together a really neat um, a visual display of actually where these birds go. This is the Brazos, Brazos River in Texas coast and uh, our bird now, Ohana, has uh, been here um, twice uh, during migration. Uh, it has a satellite tag on it. It lasts for about four years, so we've been uh, getting uh, two solid years of data uh, since we tagged it in the fall of 18. And uh, it's back now. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that yet. Uh, I'll tell you at the end where the bird is. But this is a habitat that the bird uses in, in Texas. Um, we're pretty excited to be able to reach out to, uh, uh, to, to natural land managers. Uh, these birds tend to find uh, either wildlife management areas, uh, wildlife refuges, or other protected sites, especially in the U.S., uh, which, which is, emphasizes the need for uh, land protection and, um, and, uh, and management. So uh, we're, we're, we're uh, justifying, if you will, the, uh, the efforts uh, to maintain and, and protect tracts of land that looks like that, that looks like this. So they're not the only ones, uh, wimbrels are not the only ones migrating at that time. You'll see a lot of familiar faces in here uh, for birds that come through Connecticut, uh, both spring and fall. Um, and uh, and uh, red knots are mixed in there, we have short-billed dowagers, um, lots of semi-palmated sandpipers, these little guys up front. And then of course, ruddy turnstone looking really sharp and breeding plumage. So, Remember this ready that I have a picture of another picture in just a moment. Uh, Sanderling surprisingly um, uh, put on uh, a variety of, um, of patterns and, and intensity as far as the dark plumage coming in. They're really highly variable for breeding. Uh, they get uh, very blanched out in white in the winter and most of us uh, in New England know them as one of our few wintering uh, shorebirds. So, uh, all these birds are, are doing something similar to what the Wimbrel is doing. They're, they're stopping over in very food-rich areas. Delaware Bay is well known for, uh, for its uh, horseshoe crab spawn, and the birds are, are going there and eating um, horseshoe crab eggs. But uh, up and down the Atlantic coast, there are sites where birds are staging and, and, um, and finding the food resources they need to go north. Uh, intertidal areas, I cannot overemphasize the importance for shorebirds uh, throughout uh, the migration season. Uh, the, the, the area between the high tide and low tide um, is something that uh, is uh, critical to uh, our shorebirds that depend on our coast. There are some grassland species that are, that are less dependent um, or not dependent at all about in our intertidal zone areas along the coast, but the vast majority of, bird, of shorebirds in North America uh, have some tie-in to uh, intertidal feeding areas. Uh, okay, so our bird uh, staged in Texas for about a month and a half and then flew nonstop all the way up to, um, it's actually Northwest Territories in Canada, uh, about 2,300 miles, uh, two to three days to get up there. And depending on the snowpack, uh, the bird could go right through its territory. If there's too much snow there, as we saw this year, it will either get up into the snow and come back down and wait, um, or it will uh, come in uh, right to the edge of the snowpack, and then uh, when things warm up a little bit, go back up to territory. So they're, they have super high site fidelity, so these birds are going back to the same nesting territory. Um, this bird, uh, Ahanu, uh, has been to the exact same marsh here twice, and um, and I want to tell you, we, an eBird, if anybody's not an eBird fan or on eBird yet, uh, it's becoming a big, better and bigger tool all the time. Um, 
uh, Cornell has um, his eBird, and we, we actually found somebody who did a river trip right through where Ohanu's territory was in Northwest um, Territories and got in touch with that person. And uh, he had actually done photos the same day that he had um, seen Wimbrels in that area and Mark Wimbrels in Northwest Territories right, very close to where Ohanu was. So uh, Matthew Zappa uh, was paddling down this river. And um, similarly down below, this is a really nice uh, boreal um, tundra mix habitat. Um, red knots, red knots. Uh, go all the way up in the hierarchic, uh, while in the northern Hudson Bay, in Canada, big rocky, gravelly slopes, and um, the uh, red knots pick um, sites that are um, very secluded and little patches of lichen and mosses. These birds will uh, tuck in and have a nest. So really neat pattern that blends right in that back pattern. If you wonder why some shorebirds look the way they do, uh, frequently it's, it has to do with exactly where they nest. Arctic nesting shorebirds usually lay one clutch. The larger ones, some of the smaller ones, like some of sandpipers, will nest multiple times um, if they lose their first or even second clutches. But red knots will lay one nest, um, and it enhances some of their vulnerability for, for the birds if they're not successful uh, in reproducing in, in a given year. Um, so four eggs per clutch. Uh, usually tucked into an area that is out uh, just outside of, um, out of the wind blast and quite a bit warmer down in the, the nest cup area than even an inch or two above. Uh, the Arctic is quite windy um, and uh, so they, they really select this, this nesting sites carefully. Uh, Sunny palmate and sandpipers on display. Shorebirds in the Arctic start doing um, aerial displays, ground displays, calling, singing, uh, they turn into very different animals when they get up on territory and uh, nesting ground. So this is, um, this looks like a male with a quite a short bill, male semi-palmate sandpiper um, trying to display to what appears to be a female ignoring his, uh, his antics. Uh, I've always wondered why buddy turnstones um, look the way they do, that uh, really lovely patterned uh, black and white. And uh, my colleague Shiloh Schulte took this picture on uh, Coates Island uh, in Hudson Bay. And if you squint a little bit, uh, that white and black pattern of that uh, face of that ruddy turnstone just blends into that uh, cobbly, uh, rocky background. And suddenly the um, the birds' patterns and colors um, make a lot of sense. That bird is on eggs, uh, so that's absolute nesting uh, habitat right on the coast of this small island in Hudson Bay. Um, this is a ruddy turnstone nest, and um, we joke about it's a little bit of an OCD uh, ruddy turnstone with uh, lining the rocks just absolutely perfectly. I would have loved to have seen uh, building and putting that nest together. Uh, but um, I'm sure it would have been uh, pretty fascinating to watch it move all those pebbles around. Uh, but again, four eggs in the nest up there. Um, so, so the birds are there for a short period of time, as we saw before. Uh, the adults tend to leave well before the, the young do. Uh, the young are, are once they become uh, thermo uh, dependent, so that they can. Uh, um, keep themselves uh, warmed. Uh, uh, the males of these birds tend to be more of a heating blanket than anything and protector when they're on the Arctic tundra. When the, when the adults leave, they leave when the, the young are, are independent. And frequently um, during the beginning of migration from the Arctic, four uh, chicks will travel together and those four uh, will be from the same nest. Uh, so they stay together as, a, as their first small flock. Uh, okay, so our bird Ahanu uh, has finished nesting up here in Northwest Territories and flies for another two or three days um, 
leaves there and flies down to uh, the east. This is an actual track. The bird uh, we thought was going to go out over the Atlantic to South America, but uh, actually came back last year right to uh, where we tagged it in Wallfleet. So this huge dog leg uh, during migration. This year, uh, similar pattern, except it came down here and, and dropped south. And then Lake Ontario sent it uh, to the uh, to the east from Massachusetts. So this bird came in from the from the west this year and is back on uh, is back on Wellfleet right now out on the Cape. So that's uh, uh, we're, we'll be waiting. But this um, this next trip down for the bird is uh, returned back down to what I would consider its real home down here in the south. Okay. So in the moments we have left, because I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, I want to go through, um, New England has some lovely pocket marshes. This is salt marsh. Um, and when you have a salt marsh with beach uh, um, combination, that's a very uh, important um, and well-used habitat throughout New England. Uh, we have not been good to our marshes historically, but where those marshes exist now, uh, shorebirds can usually find that found there, and this time of the year is a really nice time um, to find them there. Uh, like these short-billed dowagers um, using the edge of a salt marsh uh, in Tidal Creek, uh, just for resting it at high tide period. They're not feeding, the, the, the water's too deep for them, so they're hanging and digesting what they ate uh, during the low tide. So, uh, much more to point this talk. Kinetic Audubon uh, manages this, and I was poking around on <clears throat> on Google Earth, and um, what I mentioned earlier with uh, a sandy area that is backed by a salt marsh. This combination, this is a one-two punch for for shorebirds. And um, if I were to cruise along uh, using Google Earth up the coast and uh, ran into this site, I would think. Wow, this looks like a really good shorebird spot. Um, uh, this extensive salt marsh, the, the birds would be feeding out here at low tide within these creeks. Uh, a big open flat like this, an open uh, mud flat, super important. And uh, I imagine you do uh, um, get some good bird numbers here. Uh, this whole, this, I'm sure this is all changed, a highly dynamic outer beach like this. But the general pattern here with a nice interior pool, uh, I'm sure this is. Uh, at some points really loaded with shorebirds in this quiet area. They tend to go, um, many uh, many different species will go and use um, some of these lower um, uh, lower energy areas associated with outer beaches like this. So uh, really important to protect sites like this. Um, we've got the nesting bird you're very familiar with, piping plover, um, American oyster catcher, so oyster catcher chick down here. Oyster catcher is really doing well and coming up in New England. Um, very simple um, uh, symbolic fencing is used throughout New England, particularly piping plovers and, uh, and as a secondary or sometimes primary uh, protective um, species. The uh, least terns can use these. I put these in here because uh, by leaving uh, these, um, uh, these protected areas up, the areas that beachgoers get upset with. Um, by leaving those through August and September, uh, you really are doing a nice thing for the migrants that are coming through because they use those exact same beaches to rest on during this high tide period. So I think it's really important when people can to leave those offenses up. Um, really interesting um, new newish. Uh, effort and it's gone international with um, using um, the art of school children and their uh, passion for wildlife to create signs that people tend to pay a lot of attention to. Um, so if you are not, if Connecticut Audubon is not already going into the schools and having people um, have uh, sometimes in classroom contests, art contests, uh, you'll be amazed at, at the the, the quality of the signs that come out, and they tend to be much more effective in convincing people not to uh, trammel, trammel over beach nesting, or in this case, um, migratory bird areas. Um, so really neat uh, time of year. Uh, birds are molting like that 
um, uh, sandaling on the left. Uh, it's trying to steal food from the Godwit uh, in that particular picture, which they do frequently. I just want to mention uh, roosting time again, there's resting time and uh, leaving rack alone, leaving um, uh, the, uh, the vegetative debris up on the beach that dries there uh, because a lot of shorebirds use it as a, as a camouflage uh, technique. Uh, you can imagine a peregrine coming over and uh, not being able to see uh, the difference here between some of the rack, uh, some of the, the vegetation on the beach, and these birds. They use it um, very heavily for hiding and resting during a high tide period. Similarly, um, a seaweed that comes in and um, uh, that washes around in near shore areas becomes a feeding site. This is a semi-palmate sandpiper having a little bit of a dispute here. Um, another site, um, I'm going to actually end on this slide, but a Sandy Point Bird Sanctuary, another site on your coast that um, I think has a uh, uh, good showing of shorebirds at this time of year. Uh, and if you look at this, it's the same, same combination of this uh, nice um, a remote beach, um, exposed beach area where the birds can uh, roost successfully at high tide. It's got not, a lot of intertidal shoals here, lots of good feeding areas. This is, it must be a really nice drainage. I bet a lot of um, um, greater yellow legs can be seen feeding in here. They eat a lot of fish. And then you've got this nice basin that's all com combined with the, with the beach. So uh, you do have some really nice spots in Connecticut um, and, uh, and, uh, and similarly in other parts of uh, New England too. We're at a really nice uh, time of year and, and uh, protecting this habitat and, and uh, working with the public and, um, and other uh, agencies, the, the state wildlife agencies um, I found are really uh, helpful in helping to manage people and keep uh, keep the birds healthy and let them feed up the way they need to. So um, I'm going to actually skip this slide and go to questions. This is a lot more about what we do at Manor. And uh, if you, I'd love to uh, have you go to our website if you're interested, uh, but I'm going to skip that and go to questions because I think uh, we, we have a few minutes left for questions. And I have all night left for questions, but I think probably other people I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to go home tonight. But so anyway, um, Patrick, I'll turn it over to you as far as the questions and do my best to answer anything that uh, people might want to know. Uh, I think you're on mute, Patrick. Yeah, um, I was. I wasn't able okay. to unmute, but uh, one of the hosts yep. was able to unmute me. Um, great. Um, our first question comes from Laura. And she wants to know, are wind turbines proving to be disruptive to shorebird migrations? The two-part question, I'll start with that. Yeah, could, sorry, could you say that my, my, my volume was down? Can you say that one more time? I think, I think the microphone on my computer is uh, faulty, so I'm going to get closer to my computer here. The first question is from Laura, and she wants to know, are wind turbines proving to be disruptive to shorebird migration? Wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question, Laura. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, and as one of my colleagues said, um, it's very hard to measure um, what's disruptive and what's not disruptive. Um, I think wind turbines, we all want renewable energy in. Um, I think the, the jury's out on how um, detrimental some of these turbines will be. Uh, on some days, uh, and, and with some flocks of birds, uh, I'm sure there will be collisions. Um, and uh, and other times, there will be some exclusive effect. I know that birds will avoid uh, wind turbine areas. So uh, I actually do not know. Um, I do not know the answer to that. But there are people uh, that are working on that uh, very rigorously. But I don't know what the answer is. I think um, um, some studies in Europe have shown that, that offshore wind is one of the least damaging um, options of energy for, uh, uh, for birds and other wildlife. It does have some in acoustic impact on whales, uh, particularly in the, in the construction phase. Um, <clears throat> but um, 
everything uh, um, has its downside. Nuclear power, what do we do with the waste? Uh, fossil fuels, climate change, but it's also tremendously damaging to extract those fossil fuels. Um, it, so, uh, you know, every bit of gasoline we put in our car is, is, is impacting shorebirds. They're, they're, they're mining the tar sands of, uh, of Alberta, um, which is prime shorebird nesting habitat. And they're turning that into crude oil to uh, turn into gasoline. So um, it is a very difficult, um, and there's no free lunch yet, as far as we know, uh, for, for energy. Um, there's a, the second part of this question is for the Connecticut Audubon Society. It's asking, what is Connecticut Audubon's position on the proposed wind energy plan for Long Island Sound? Uh, I wanted to say there is no proposed wind energy plan for Long Island Sound. There is no, um, there are no wind projects proposed for Long Island Sound. You may be thinking of the last legislative session. We, Connecticut committed to buying a certain amount of megawatts of offshore wind. That is actually very far offshore wind. And um, um, off of, uh, you know, out on the continental shelf. And um, one of the things that we, um, Audubon, Connecticut, the Connecticut Audubon Society did was we were part of a group that reviewed those requests for proposals of, for wind energies so that there are requirements in there for the construction and maintenance of those wind turbines that minimize the impact to whales and to uh, migratory birds. And finally, I also wanna put in, uh, you may have heard that the US Fish and Wildlife Service has greatly weakened or proposed greatly weakening the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Connecticut Audubon Society, Manomet, and others um, have been very active in fighting those uh, proposed weakenings of, of the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Recently, there was a judge ruling that threw out those, those weakening uh, uh, proposals, but we also offered an opportunity for people to submit comments on that. And also, uh, we support a uh, piece of federal legislation called the Migratory Bird Protection Act. If there are wind turbines proposed for Long Island Sound, and it's actually very unlikely considering the wind profiles of the Long Island Sound, uh, lots of groups would be against that. And uh, Connecticut Audubon Society would definitely take a very close look at that. Um, the second question we have, uh, and if people have follow-up questions, they can feel free to type them in and we can, we can get to them if, uh, if we have time. The second question is from Liz. It's been partially answered, but um, when is the best time to see sanderlings on the Connecticut shore and what are the best sites? I'll let Brad say a few words on this and I have some thoughts as well. Yeah, I would, um, sanderlings are an amazing bird. I think they're, uh, you know, shorebirds in general are understudied and sanderlings, I think they're just uh, unending work that could be done on sanderlings. Um, they are super hardy and I think time to see sanderlings uh, is during the some of the most bitter cold winter days because they're right out there in the surf zone and feeding and I think your numbers probably build up in Connecticut and uh, they're a little bit later migrant generally in the higher numbers. Dunlin uh, will be right there with them in September, October. So I would, uh, I'm going to guess here a little bit but I'd say starting in uh, late September, right through the winter time, you could go see uh, sanderlings. In the springtime, there's a little short window, and in May, when some will, will really get on some nice uh, breeding plumage, but sanderlings go way up north, and they tend to leave uh, a little earlier. Uh, but they're, it, I'll say one more thing, Patrick. Um, they um, sanderlings can be found in in non-breeding uh, season on both co coast, almost the entire coast um, uh, of South America. Both, they're, they're phenomenally uh, wide distribution in, in uh, the wintertime. I'll leave it at that. Great, um, I can add some local perspective to the um, sanderlings. And, and I have to agree with you, Brad, that, that the springtime is a wonderful time to see sanderlings if you can get them in that window. I call sanderlings the fingerprint bird because they're, migra they're molting from winter plumage into their breeding plumage uh, in a, over a course of a couple of weeks in late April into May. As soon as they hit peak breeding plumage or get close to it, that's when they leave. So every bird that you see there in the spring, you can see hundreds of them in a place like Milford Point um, or Sandy Point. 
almost every bird looks different. And, and, and it, it, it's just, I, I love seeing flocks of, of sanderling as they're, they're turning um, into breeding plumage. Likewise, uh, they're, they're moving through now, as, as Frank said, uh, he's had 200 at Milford Point yesterday. They're losing their luster, if you will. They're becoming much whiter. You, they have a little bit of hint of, of breeding color still left in them. Uh, but um, it, if you want a reliable place, Long Beach and Stratford um, in the wintertime has flocks of Dunlin and Sanderling there every day. Um, and uh, I love going in there in the morning uh, uh, on the way to work. Um, and uh, seeing uh, the, the flocks of them sitting there right on the, the public beach, uh, right off of the parking area. Uh, sometimes you can see up to um, uh, 500 or so mixed flocks, um, and, and, and they're, 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 they're relatively cooperative for, for photography. The next question is from Stratford, and um, they say that they're blessed, they're blessed to live on the other side of the river from Milford Point, as am I. Um, they, want, they want to know how much does poor weather like hurricanes affect the journey? Is there any documentation? That's a really great question. Um, I can tell you just about wimbrels. Um, we've had birds quite clearly avoid entire tropical systems um, and go out of their way, usually out a little bit farther out over the Atlantic to totally bypass a uh, tropical system coming north. We've also had wimbles that go right through, right into hurricanes and eventually come out the other side and make it to, uh, to safe harbor. So uh, we have both. Um, the, uh, the frequency of tropical storms, um, uh, increased frequency and uh, the uh, energy of these storms uh, probably influences or will impact uh, some migrants and certainly um, uh, well, I'll say sh should uh, some migrants. It, in some cases, uh, I think they could be detrimental, especially for some of the smaller shorebirds uh, in large flocks that tend to, to, to fly in uh, larger flocks. Um, there is staggered migration going on, as I indicated. So um, any one of these storms is, is not going to take out probably the entire population of any species on um, the Atlantic, uh, South Atlantic. Uh, we have some wimbrels, for instance, and other birds that, that leave off, uh, off of the Canadian Maritimes and even farther north, uh, Newfoundland, and they drop down to Brazil from there. And they really, they bypass all of the uh, southeast, uh, all of our Atlantic uh, storm zone by going that far out over the Atlantic. So, so it's, a, it's a combination of things that, uh, with the storms. Good question. One of the uh, hurricanes, the Category 5 one, and I forget which one it was, passed right over the key wintering area for piping plovers uh, uh, in the Bahamas, uh, the area where all of our, almost all of our uh, piping plovers are thought to winter. And it was a Category 5 when it passed right over the exact shoals where, where all of our plovers were. We were really worried that, um, that we were going to lose our piping plovers because of this, it was right at the worst possible time, right as, as they were arriving there in the fall. Turns out they knew it was coming. And there's some satellite trackers that show, showed that some of the piping plovers went to another area before the storm and then came back after the storm. And we didn't see any noticeable decline of, of, of piping plovers. So I just wanted to add, add that little anecdote. Um, the next uh, question is from Deborah. Um, and she says that the tracking of the Wimble reminds her of the delightful novel Jello Legs, written many years ago by Professor John Genovi, um, uh, uh, a biologist at, at, at University of Nebraska. Um, so this is more of a comment. Um, uh, he was tracking a singular bird that had come to known in Nebraska and chased it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. It's a delightful book, and all of his books are a wonderful mix of science and fiction. Um, this is a question from uh, Representative Mary Mashinsky. Um, hi, Mary. Um, is, it, is our task to keep people from disrupting these travelers at high tide? Uh, wow. Um, <laughs> in my view, I would say that that's an important part of coastal conservation. Um, and it's not only, it's not just high tide, but that's definitely the bottleneck for a lot of these birds. Uh, and it turns out that um, in, in 
uh, July when some of the migrants start coming down and you have uh, some of your beach nesters still on eggs sometimes or, or with young chicks, uh, that high tide period uh, when people are restricted and all the birds are restricted really is a key point to a key time to uh, be vigilant and to cut down on the kind of disturbance that could take place. At lower tide on the wet sand beaches um, uh, where disturbance especially from dogs can be really bad. Um, people walking casually on some of the big uh, intertidal flats is much less disturbing or or problematic for birds. So uh, I would I would say um, that's a really good start is to maintain or to uh, to keep protections uh, in line at, at high tide. Yeah. And yes, um, Mary, that is a big focus of ours. Um, Semi-palmated sandpipers in fall migration fall, uh, have been documented from flying from Hudson Bay directly to our shore, fattening up for a few days and then flying directly to the north shore of, of the Gulf of Mexico. We know that they feed on a tidal cycle, not on a diurnal cycle. They're out there feeding at night um, and they just stop feeding at high tide to rest. That high tide, as Brad demonstrated in his talk, is incredibly important for them. So we have, um, uh, we, we, um, our, our primary focus this year has been trying to reduce disturbance for roosting um, semi-palmated sandpipers at um, Milford Point in Milford and at Stratford Point in Stratford. And we've done this through uh, putting up fencing um, in different areas outside of the nesting season. Uh, we've sort of kind of blocked off the north side of the spit at Milford, which is where most of the shorebirds roost at high tide, and people have been respecting that. Um, and at, at Stratford Point, we've put out a square, our, our partner Audubon, Connecticut, has put out a square of string fencing in the area where most of the semi-palmated sandpipers roost at high tide. A flocks of up to 5,000 of them can roost there. And we found, we found markedly um, reduced disturbance of our semi-palmated sandpipers this year from, from, from humans. They still get desert, disturbed by, um, uh, by uh, um, peregrine falcons quite often. Um, I think this is probably the last question. Um, it is um, from Frank Mantlick. Um, he's one of our regional board members and a real great birder in, in Connecticut. Um, Brad, it's well documented that the red knot population has declined se severely in the past 50 years, uh, 30 years, a tragedy. Are there any signs that it is rebounding at all? Wow, well, that's a really, that's a very good question, Frank. Thanks for asking that. Um, uh, there are no signs of a rebound per se, especially for the super long distance migrants. We think that the biggest declines uh, the people have been measuring both in North and South America are primarily uh, with the super long distance migrants, the cohort of roofer red knot that go all the way down into Southern um, South America, Argentina, Chile, um, all the way down Tierra del Fuego and this place called Bahia Lomas, a huge, huge mud flat down there. Those are, have been marked declines and we think those are the major declines that people have been seeing. There's another cohort that actually uh, um, winters farther north and includes the southeastern U.S. Uh, and throughout the Caribbean basin. Um, and so those birds we think are much more stable and actually uh, are are now a much more significant part of the population. Measuring changes in populations over time, um, unless there's some big drop like there was with uh, the, the red knot, um, is very hard on a year-to-year -year basis. So looking at five and 10 year changes uh, is where we usually start to do the work and figure out what the trend is over time. So we've not seen any rebounds. Um, there's been a lot of work done on horseshoe crabs. Believe it or not, there's a lot more pressure building in horseshoe crabs right now. They've been playing a role in COVID, uh, in, the, in the COVID scenario. Um, so that yet, has yet to play out, uh, but there's a lot of pressure right now uh, for increased blood levels from, um, from horseshoe crabs for the medical industry. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you something very definitive, but. Um, uh, if anything, uh, the 
long distance migrants um, are continuing to tick downwards as far as numbers go. Uh, and we don't know enough, but we think that the, the, uh, the other population is fairly uh, stable right now from what we've been seeing in numbers. Great, and that's the last question we have um, uh, to uh, um, time to, to address tonight. But if, if people have additional questions, they could ask through our Facebook page or, or reach me at pcummins, P-C-O-M-I-N-S at ctaudubon.org. I can either answer or, or forward it on to Brad. Um, we have a couple of more um, uh, um, wrap up slides that we'd like to show you. I think, uh, I Brad, just hit stop share. Share, there we go, okay, perfect. Great, so um, thank you so much for attending tonight's webinar. I did mention that we do get grant money from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in some years to fund our grant, uh, our, our shorebird conservation work. Um, we don't get it every year, and even when we do get this money, it requires a non-federal match. So uh, please consider joining or supporting Connecticut Audubon Society if you can. Uh, we've made it easy. We've put up this little code. All you need to do is point your uh, smartphone camera at this, and that will take you directly to an opportunity to either join or, um, or donate to the Connecticut Audubon Society. Um, thank you so much to Brad. I also want to thank our, our Audubon Alliance partners. And I did neglect to mention that we work very closely with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, um, uh, their, their wildlife division, and all of these efforts. Uh, essentially, we are the eyes and the ears of the wildlife division out there. Um, we tell them when, when, it's, uh, when, it, when it's time to put up the, the uh, um, piping clover exclosures. Uh, we tell them when there's problems. Uh, they, they, they help us get, get the law enforcement involved. Uh, it's a great partnership. Um, and it's great, great partnership between RTPI and uh, Audubon Connecticut and Connecticut Audubon Society and Manomet as well. We, we uh, have volunteers doing international shorebird surveys um, and you have, there's opportunities to do ISS throughout the fall and your time spent monitoring uh, shorebirds. If you see any shorebirds or coastal waterbirds and post them to, to eBird and share them with CT Waterbirds at gmail.com, your hours spent uh, birding will actually go and be volunteer time to help us match our federal grants. So, um, but uh, please, I know it's difficult times, um, but if you're able to donate, uh, any donations you can provide are, are much appreciated. Thank you.